still people coming in. Good morning. My name is Reverend Audrey Brooks and I'm a member of the Social Justice Working Group at the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. We're honored today by the presence of Chantal Chagnon, who is an activist, a Cree, a Métis storyteller, and will be talking with us today with our topic of truth, honesty, and reconciliation. But she will begin with introducing herself and uh, to begin our program together. Chantal. Hello. My name is Chantal Chagnon. I am Cree, Anishinaabe, and Métis from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, which is in Treaty 6 territory. Uh, I drove up here from Mohinstis, um, which is Calgary, uh, in Treaty 7 territory, which is where I live right now. Um, but it's just a pleasure and an honor to be here, to be able to share in a good way from my heart, uh, to talk about my family, my experience, and how we can do better as a community. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I dive a little bit into the land acknowledgement and why we must do it in a, in a respectful and in an appropriate way and to know where our place is in that. But um, I'm really excited to share with everyone today. Magwitch for having me. Hi, hi, and thank you. We bid you welcome to this beloved community, wherever you are. Whether in the church or online, you are welcome here. Whatever your faith or life journey, Whoever you call family, wherever you carry grief, hurt, or joy, you are welcome here. We offer you the companionship of others who also walk journeys and have faith in each other in these difficult times together. We have much to do, much to be thankful for, for we all part of all of the parts of the earth and of each other. You are welcome here. Chantelle, I invite you to light the candle for us today. We light this candle to remind us of the strength of this community. As we bring the power of love to our relationship with indigenous peoples and with other, each other. The indigenous peoples are the ancestors of this country. We in this place and this time search for justice and equity for all who share this land and answer the call to act on our beliefs in all our relationships. And I also invite you, Chantel, to do the land acknowledgement. Panse Ozu, Tanshi, Oki. So when we do the land acknowledgement, it's much more than just acknowledging the land. It's acknowledging the families that have been here for thousands upon thousands of generations. When we do it, it's to establish a sense of space. Because if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. It's important to acknowledge the families that have been here because there's stories that are steeped into this land that we have so much to learn from each other and grow together and build community in a meaningful way. In this territory, I acknowledge my ancestors, the Cree. I acknowledge, of course, the Anishinaabe, which I am also, the Métis, the Dene, the Nata, the Nata. And I think it's really important just to acknowledge the Stoney and the Blackfoot and all people that call this land their home. It's also really important to know and acknowledge that when we say First Nations, we're all not one and the same. There are hundreds and hundreds of nations across Turtle Island. 
and would be like going to you know, Asia or going to Africa or going to Europe and saying, everybody's exactly the same because they're on the same continent, which is not the truth. So it's important to learn from many different elders and knowledge keepers and storytellers, drummers and singers, and to hear their story, to hear the story of their nation and how their ancestors speak through them. When we do the land acknowledgement, it's acknowledging the responsibility that we have to learn from our past, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us, so that we can make a better world for our future generations. It also teaches us how important it is to build a relationship with each other and with the land itself, because the land itself teaches us so much about who we are, where we're going, and how to get there. And we can learn so much from each other's stories. And so to welcome everyone in a good way, I wanted to share the Cree welcome song. Traditionally, when we sing songs, we sing in rounds of four to honor the four directions of the medicine wheel. But this song is a little different. We actually sing it in rounds of three. And that's to keep the circle open and welcoming so everyone completes the circle today. Because in a circle, we're all connected. There's no beginning. There's no end. No one is greater or less than anyone else in the circle, just like in the hoop of life. So it teaches us to honor each other for those differences. Because if everybody was exactly the same, the world would be incredibly boring and nothing would ever get done. So we need those differences to be able to come together in the circle and make our community thrive. It teaches us to come into the circle without judgment, not to compare ourselves to others because we're on completely different journeys than them. We're completely different people than them. And it also teaches us that we might not agree 100% of the time, but it's when we can come together and find those compromises, that's truly what makes our community strong and resilient. Mia Sin, which is the Cree welcome song, is from the Natahau family, from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation. And I thank that family for keeping this song alive because for so many generations, it was difficult. We weren't allowed to share our stories, to share our songs, to speak our languages, to practice our ceremony, to even wear the regalia that I'm wearing now, which I, I am so proud to be able to wear because it's another costume. Costumes are for Halloween, and I was a superhero for Halloween. But it's a story of who I am. It's a story of my family and my ancestors. It's the story of the teachings that I carry forward and the story of my very being in an outside way. And so I'm very proud and humbled to be able to share this song with you, to be able to stand before you in my regalia, and to be able to teach and share what was meant to be shared. The true spirit and intention of the treaties was to learn from each other. And Miasin honors that. It was to grow together. Miasin honors that. It's our way to call our ancestors in and bring them together. If there was pets here, they would be freaking out going, who are all these people? <laughs> but also it brings us together as ancestors. It teaches us that we are all related. The plants and the animals, the stones, the winds, the waters, they connect each and every one of us. We're not above or below creation, we're part of it. And this is truly what this song honors. Mia Sin doesn't just mean welcome, it also means beautiful. Mia Sin. Me as Oh! 
into the circle today. We're good. Thank you so much, Chantal. I think I will just sit for a minute with that before we have our first hymn. Number 121, We'll Build a Land, by Carolyn McDade, who has said, My heart is moved by all I cannot change. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, which with no extraordinary power reconstitute the world. Hymn number 121, We'll Build a Land. Gordon? sharing some information with us, and then we will continue. I'm going to light a candle for Ruth Patrick, our beloved Ruth Patrick. Um, she's in the hospital with pneumonia, is stable and moving forward towards health, but been in correspondence with her daughter Joan and she welcomes your loving whatever you do. <laughs> Prayers, healing vibes, good thoughts, warm hearts. Send it out into the ether, healing for Ruth Patrick. 
thank you. And we all know that Ruth was one of the original members of the Unitarian Church here in Edmonton. So uh, we wish her very well. Also, this is a flame of community. And we invite you to come forward and uh, line up over there and light a candle uh, while I read the following words. Uh, this candle is a flame of community, as I said. It celebrates who we are together here and in the larger world. We share this candle this morning in empathy with the people of British Columbia, the people, the creatures in the land who have suffered drought and fire and flood. And we stand here in, in our, our province of Alberta and look over that mountain and, and understand the depths of their disaster and our hearts go to them. When about one of us hurts, hurts, we're all hurt because we are all one people. And this is why we can and will find ways to offer our help to the people of British Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful music. We've already met our speaker, Chantal, storm song, Shanyong. I love that. On the topic of truth, honesty, and reconciliation. Chantal is a Cree Métis singer, drummer, artist, storyteller, actor, educator, among a, a long list of many things that she accomplishes and many gifts that she shares. She recognizes that sharing culture and building community is an integral part of building bridges and of understanding and acceptance. Afterward, uh, Chantal will spend a few minutes answering any questions that you have, and uh, Susan is going to bring uh, and a microphone around and you can uh, share your, your questions. Uh, welcome Chantel, before you start, I would like to uh, complete protocol by offering you sacred tobacco 
as part of our agreement for you being here today. It. Even in ceremony, we don't actually bring it into our bodies, um, but it's a spiritual gift. So when we receive it, it's saying thank you from our spirit to someone else's spirit. Um, and when we uh, gift it to someone to ask them for a favor, it's more binding than any legal contract because it's a spiritual contract. And this is really what the treaties were. They were all signed with tobacco, so they were spiritual contracts. I have a beautiful elder, Sex Powderface. And he said that when we signed the treaties, it was like a pendulum. But that pendulum started and it began with tobacco. But unfortunately, when the treaties were signed, the intention wasn't pure on the other side, but ours was because ours was with creator. And so it was like a pendulum swinging. And so this is where we found residential schools and people were put onto reserves in the Indian Act and there was acts of genocide, uh, cultural and actual physical. Uh, you know, we had the 60s scoop and now we have residential school 2.0. We also have the justice system, which is completely skewed. But now what we're seeing is we've come from this really, really dark place and we're starting to swing back. That pendulum is starting to swing back because that original agreement was signed with tobacco. And so now, we're seeing that those traditional ways of knowing, they were not extinguished. They burn brighter than ever. They're becoming more predominant. People are being able to share them more, to be able to talk about them more without fear, without judgment. And people are starting to understand that traditional ways of knowing and being and living on the land and living with each other, they have so much more value to each and every one of us, no matter where we are from, no matter what our teachings we have these threads of truth and belonging and connection and community that are within those. And that was the true spirit and intention of the treaty, was to learn from each other. It's such a gift to be able to share on stages like this where we wouldn't have been invited to share in positions like this, in churches. I mean, I still get triggered coming into services um, just because of my upbringing. Um, my kokum, my grandmother, she was raised in the residential school. And in turn, she never learned how to raise kids. All she learned growing up was pain and hurt and abuse and sadness and hardship and shame for bo being who we were as Indigenous people. And in turn, no matter how far she moved away from our reserve, so she ended up joining the Air Force, uh, just to get as far away from the reserve as possible so her kids didn't have to experience the residential school system. But even though they were far, far, far away, and my mom was even born in Zweibruck in Germany, East Germany, before the wall fell, so she's an honest to goodness German Indian. <laughs> um, she still experienced all of those same things, all of that hardship and that abuse and that sadness and that shame um, and she never really experienced unconditional love growing up because my cookum, my grandmother didn't know how to gift that. And in turn, that's what my mom passed down to me. You know, so I grew up with a lot of hurt and a lot of pain and a lot of hardship. I was born here in Edmonton in an old residential school hospital. And I felt those spirits lingering with me. I always felt like there was something wrong with me, there was something missing. Um, and the only time I ever felt full, I ever felt whole, is when I connected with my great-grandfather and we would sneak off and we would go smudging and he would tell me stories about the medicines and about the animals and how to hunt and how to fish and how to trap. And whenever we went to the reserve or as my cookum called it, the farm, <laughs> whenever we would go, um, I would sneak off with the elders and sit in ceremony. And that's the only time I ever felt full. I ever felt healed. I ever felt connected. And so I was able to break that cycle of intergenerational trauma with my own children. And that's what we need to do with our whole society. We need to recognize that those teachings and those ceremonies and those songs and those stories, they deeply connect each and every one of us. And this is part of our healing journey. Oftentimes when we look at the situation as a whole, we see that history, we see that past, it becomes really overwhelming. And we don't think we can do anything to change. We don't think we can do anything to make a difference. It's really difficult to heal. It 
from all of that pain and trauma that we have collectively experienced together. You might not have perpetrated, you know, those atrocities, but when you look back, you're like, how? How were my people, how was my church, how were these people able to get away with this? And why hasn't anything been done? Holding people accountable is first and foremost. That is really important. But also it's really important to be an ally. Being an ally does not mean wearing an orange shirt once a year or hanging a red dress in a tree once a year, but it is an ongoing thing. Reconciliation is reconciliation action. It's knowing those truths, even if they hurt, even if they're uncomfortable, even if they're traumatizing and hard to hear. It's important that we know that history and that truth because these are people's stories, these are people's experiences that we have gone through and we continue to go through. As an ally, sure, it's great to wear an <laughs> orange shirt, but if you're not doing the action on a daily basis, what are you doing? That's nothing but lip service. It's important to step into those leadership roles where you can bring people's voices forward. Those marginalized voices need to be heard. Our stories need to be heard, no matter how uncomfortable they might seem, no matter how painful they are. It's like ripping on a, off a Band-Aid. Sometimes you need to do that. But if you're not treating what's underneath the skin, it's just going to fester. You have to be able to pull out that pain, pull out that trauma, pull out that hurt, so that we're able to heal fully and completely. It's important to come together and learn from each other, to bring people into our communities, and to build community in a meaningful way. In your position, it's things as simple as buying from local artists. Don't buy a dream catcher that's made in China because you like the way it looks. Actually source amazing indigenous artists that are local. Listen to indigenous stories. Listen to those indigenous songs. There are so many incredible podcasts that you can listen to that will teach you so much about who you are. Even audiobooks or physical books can teach you the story of indigenous people and the way that we see the world. And it can really change the way that you see the world as well. Because that is truly what we need to do to come together to rebuild our society in a good way. It's also holding our leadership accountable. In Cree, a leader is a warrior. And a warrior isn't someone who's fighting on the front lines every single day. A warrior is a person who stands up for what's right. A warrior is of service. They give to their community because that's what true strength and courage looks like someone who stands up and advocates for those who are missing their voices, gives voice to the voiceless. As an ally, you have the opportunity to elevate those voices, to bring people into your spaces who may not have been heard. It's also addressing our own bias. It's recognizing that when we see someone on the street, what is our mind saying? What is our heart saying? What is our spirit saying? Oftentimes our heart will overspeak and we need to shut that off. And we need to recognize each other as one family, one human family. When one of us hurts, we all hurt. When one of us suffers, we all suffer. And so we need to come together to heal fully and completely. It might be scary at first, but trust me, once that healing happens, you will never be the same. It is an incredible experience to be able to connect deeply with someone on a spiritual level, on an emotional level. And hugs are good too, so I'd say physical connection is great. <laughs> but also, it's our responsibility to our future generations. It's recognizing that the land itself is part of Indigenous sovereignty. It's understanding that what we're doing to the land we do to indigenous people. It's recognizing those injustices that are happening across the board and actually speaking out, giving voice to those things and saying, no, this isn't right. Indigenous people have been defending our future generations for years, not just indigenous future generations, all future generations. Because a smart man once said, the economy is nothing without the land and the land is nothing without the indigenous people who understand the voice that is within the land and the voice that connects each and every one of us. Everyone take a deep breath in. 
that is a sacred breath that we all share. And any time you feel like you're not sacred, just take that sacred breath and recognize that we all share the same land. We all share the same air, and we have been for many, many, many generations. I tell little kids, we've been breathing the same air as the dinosaurs, probably breathing dinosaur farts. <laughs> but it's a gift. Our breath is a gift. Our life is a gift. And to really understand that gift is to connect deeply with each other and the land. Miigwech, thank you for letting me share with you today. If you want more tips on how to be an ally, the TRC has 94 calls to action. They're not recommendations, they are calls to action. These are things you can bring in to your schools, to your communities, to your churches, to your work, to make a difference. And one little difference a day, it's like throwing a stone into a pond. It starts small, those ripples, but by the time it gets to the edge, it's a wave. So let's create waves together. Hi, hi. Miigwech. I'm going to share with you the healing song. This is also called the crying song or the wailing song. And in it, you can hear the tears. So if you get emotional, that's good. <laughs> that's a good thing. Unfortunately, our society doesn't honor our tears like we should. Uh, because our tears, is sh it shows how much we are invested in each other. It shows how much we care. And we love each other unconditionally. So when those tears come, let them come. This song we sing in, uh, in rounds of four. But the third round, we actually stop drumming. And because this is the healing song, it's asking for the things that you need in your life to heal. Those people in your life that need healing, those people that are going through hard times, our beautiful Mother Earth, which needs some time to recover. I mean, she's trying to shake us off, which is obviously very apparent with what's happening in BC and across Alberta. But it's important to recognize that and understand our relationship and our place within it. The healing starts from within, and it starts all around us. And so the healing song is a gift. It used to be only a ceremonial song that we only used to share in ceremony, but several elders who had gifted it to, um, and passed it along said, now is the time that we have to come together and heal together as one family, as all our relations. All my relations means not only us as two leggeds, the ones that walk on two legs, but the plants and the animals and stones and the winds and the rivers, all of us, we are all connected. And healing needs to come from all of us. So this is the Cree healing song. It's done with a heartbeat, which is that heartbeat of Mother Earth. It's also the healing beat or a woman's beat or an honor beat. So this is the Cree healing song. I know that there's probably some questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, advocacy work that I do. Um, so I organize a lot of marches for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit people. 
I'm a two-spirit woman myself, um, uh, and I'm really, really thankful that I carry both uh, masculine and feminine ceremonies, masculine and feminine teachings, um, and two-spirit teachings, and it's a gift to be able to share those things. Um, when I march and advocate for murdered and missing Indigenous women, I think it's really important that we show up. <laughs> When we are there, when we are present, when we're in community, not only can we learn from each other, but it shows those families who have missing loved ones that the community cares. It shows that there is support there and that their voice is still heard. Their stories are still very, very present. Um, one of the events that we have is the Valentine's Day Memorial March. And this year, it was minus 40. It was so cold, <laughs> but it didn't matter. We still stood up, we still marched together, where there was still 200 of us, freezing in minus 40, talking very quickly so that we could finish the event quickly, but we stood up strong, strong and tall for those families that still haven't had justice. I think it's really important also to hold our police accountable um, and our justice system accountable. There is no excuse for injustice to happen, but it's something that has been built and structured into our system. If an indigenous man accidentally kills a non-indigenous woman, they're going to jail for life. If a white man kills an indigenous child, they're out in six months. And this is something that is very, very true and has been proven in court constantly. This year alone, it has been. And I think it's important that we advocate for those voices and recognize how the system is structured to benefit people who are not indigenous. And we need to change that. We need to change the rules and we need to advocate for true justice because our system is broken and the only people who can change it is us. So yeah, there was that. <laughs> when we march for murdered and missing indigenous women on Valentine's Day, we have these cutouts um, and on there are uh, busts and then there are silhouettes like frames. And on each of them, we have the names of those sisters that were missing or have been murdered. Um, and on that, it says they were a mother, a mother of three. This is how old they were. It takes it out of the statistics and puts it into stories because that's what we are. We are people of stories. We have so many incredible gifts to share with each other. And as long as we stop othering each other, we can come together and actually build community and actually build healing and advocate for each other as human beings. Not as statistics, but as stories. When we carry those frames and when we carry those busts, as we're walking down the road and carrying these things and walking you know, 10 blocks, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And it reminds us of the weight that those families are carrying and the justice that they are looking for. It makes you uncomfortable for a day, for a couple of hours while you're at these marches, but it opens your eyes to exactly the struggles that these ha families have been going through for generations. And so, Miigwech, hi, hi. Thank you for letting me share with you. I could probably talk for hours, so Q&A. This is my favorite part. <laughs> Thank you. Were there any questions that anyone would like to ask uh, Chan Chantel before she, uh, before I take over? Don't be shy. You have two minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I will just a ask one. There is a story in the Globe and Mail News. There's a story in the Globe and Mail News. Is that all right? 
I have to come over here? Oh, okay. There's a story in the Globe and Mail newspaper today about Blake Desjardins, who is Member of Parliament from Edmonton. He's a two-spirited Métis guy. And it talks about his early childhood, which I did not know. His mother couldn't, you know, had many problems. His aunt raised him, no money. And it just hit me. I, he's only 28. I thought maybe he was a generation that, that, that didn't have to go through all that. And does it not get hard to keep going when there's so many difficulties? Absolutely. So um, a lot of people think that residential schools were so, so long ago, but they weren't. Uh, so if I lived on reserve, I would have gone to residential school because the last closed in 1996. Um, and so I would have gone until I was 16, uh, which is... That just showed my age. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, but our system is broken. And I know this firsthand, so I've been a cultural advocate to get kids out of care. And in fact, um, my twins, um, their mom had lost them to the system when uh, they were not even two. And they had been in foster care uh, for a decade until their family and I advocated to get them out of foster care. Um, and so I was, I stepped into that role of cultural advocate, cultural facilitator, uh, and they were placed with their grandma and then that placement fell apart because she attended the residential school system. So she had a really hard time caregiving. Um, and then they placed her with her auntie, but her aunt was overwhelmed. She already had three kids. And so her social worker came to me and said, you know, the girls are going to go back into foster care. They're going to be 13, so they're going to be separated. Um, so do you want to take them? And I said, in a heartbeat. So now I have, I have twins. <laughs> I was like, what's the best thing to do before a pandemic? Take on more kids. <laughs> but I am so thankful and humbled that they came to me. And I know that there's so many of my uh, family members, of my relations, of friends that have gotten lost in the foster care system because the foster care system is broken. It doesn't advocate for cultural connection. It um, infantilizes children, it infantilizes families, and it doesn't give them the tools that they need to thrive and survive, to build and rebuild and reconnect with their roots because that's where know that healing comes from. I was able to break that cycle of intergenerational trauma with my own kids because I was able to learn about my culture and my history and I was able to recognize that all of that abuse and hurt and shame that came from the residential school. That wasn't ours to carry. That was something that was thrust upon my family and I refused to let it move forward, not let it move past me. And so my kids have only ever understood unconditional love have you know, been thriving and they've always been proud to be who they are, the blood that runs through their veins. They are so incredibly proud to be indigenous. Um, my little guy, actually, a few years ago, he was in grade five and he comes home and he's in tears and he's like, mom, they're not doing anything at my school for National Indigenous Day. Can you come to my school and sing? I'm like, buddy, I'm at five other schools that day. I can't. He's, I'm like, what are you going to do about it? And he's like, I'm gonna go talk to my principal. And so we went and talked to his principal and she was like, well, there's nothing we can do. But then he went to talk to his vice principal and he said, this isn't right and what can we do about it? And he said, Lyndon, what are you gonna do about it? And Lyndon's like, I'm gonna wear my regalia and I'm gonna drum and sing and share a story with every single class. And so that is exactly what he did. And that shows the pride that has been instilled in my children. My eldest son, uh, he is in his last year of university taking software engineering because he knows that's going to help his community because this is a thriving field. And he knows that once he does that work, he can create incredible apps and things like that for our community to continue to share different kinds of culture, you know, different learnings, different teachings. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I have a soft spot for wee ones. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah. We have one more minute. Me too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, all of us, I think, were horrified and uh, saddened by the tragedy of the discover of the unmarked 
children's graves at the residential schools. But aside from the numbers and the uh, few demonstrations that we've been able to attend, where should we go from here? Um, we are, are confused actually about what the, the families and the people want to repatriate the remains or to mark them and memorialize them. Um, but the discovery of those graves is only the first step. And what do you think are the next steps? Well, first and foremost, uh, every community is going to have a different need for those remains. Some of them do want to mark them. Some of them want uh, to pull them out and put them in you know, their, their own cemeteries or honor them in their own way. But it's important to recognize that every nation is going to be different. Every nation is going to want to do something different, to memorialize them different, to have different kinds of ceremonies. And I think first and foremost, one of the biggest things is having spaces, creating spaces that we can mourn together. That is so important because we have lost our sense of place. We have lost our sense of space as indigenous people. We've been put onto reserves, but those, those aren't our homes. Our homes was all of Turtle Island, all of Canada, all of the states, everywhere. Uh, and when we create those spaces and open them up and recognize the privilege of just even being in this space, um, that's part of opening up that relationship and opening up that dialogue. It's recognizing that there's not a beginning, middle, and end. This is gonna be an ongoing journey for many generations to come. It's said that healing comes um, through generations, however many generations have been damaged, that's how many generations it takes to heal. So we have been going through the residential school system and, um, you know, <laughs> genocide essentially when the settlers moved here, you know, for over, over 250 years, almost 300 years. So it's going to take us that long to heal. So creating those spaces so that we can come together, we can heal, we can have that dialogue is important. It's knowing that you can't just be like, let's put a Band-Aid on it, there you go, heal. You have to be able to take that time and to recognize that sometimes healing, it comes in waves. You know, you think you're okay and then you're not. It's like when you lose someone, you think you're okay and then all of a sudden thing, you'll hear a song or you'll smell something and it triggers you and then you'll just be a sobbing mess on the floor. Because healing takes time. It's not a linear process, it's an ongoing process. And it's going to be ongoing for many of our generations. But when we create that space, that time, we allow it to happen and we support it. We don't say, what do you need? Because that's taking advocacy away. It's just saying, what can I help you with? What can I do? It's recognizing that this is part of your process. You have to offer what you can do. Don't ask them what they need. Because when you go to a funeral and somebody is just like a mess, you don't say, hey, what do you need? You say, hey, here's a casserole, you know? <laughs> well, some of those casseroles, not exactly the best, just saying. But, <laughs> but that's where we need to look. We need to be, uh, recognize what our privilege is, you know, what those gifts that we have by just simply being here and recognizing what's brought, brought our ancestors to this land, whether it be opportunities that were taken away from indigenous people, whether it be land itself that was taken away from indigenous people. And yeah, so I think it's really important to just create that sense of dialogue and relationship and let people tell you how you can help. Don't just be like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I hope that kind of clears some things up, but um, it's going to be a long and arduous process. I mean, we've already found um, close to 8,000 and Mark Graves across Canada. If anybody didn't know that, yeah, like there's a lot more being uncovered every day. Um, and we haven't even gotten to the Saskatchewan. So my reserve um, is Muskeg Lake and um, our school was St. Michael's, but we also had Labrette, that was one of our feeder schools. And Labrette was, my cookum said that's where the bad kids went and a lot of them never came home. So when we dig up Labrette, there's going to be a lot more added to that total. I think that's really important to understand. And this is a legacy that our elders remember. This is a legacy that they have experienced. And not just our elders, our young people as well, because they're still suffering from those waves, from those ripples. But we have that ability to turn the tides as long as we're working together and we're honoring those voices and we're letting people heal in their own way. That's the most important part. You can't tell someone to heal. They have to, they have to learn it for themselves and take those steps forward. You can be there, 
to offer support or casseroles. <laughs> but you have to let it happen. Thank you. I hope that helped. Thank you. Okay. We have a, a hymn, a number 1051 in the green book. And then we'll have Naomi McElwraith with her poems so that she can go and work at the uh, Fort Edmonton Indigenous uh, display. 1051. McElrace has read poetry and at the annual genocide memorial services for a long time is the author of the book Kayam a poetry book of family history and longing written in both Cree and English Naomi we go back a long way <laughs> and I also offer you the protocol of tobacco for your work and for the work that you do at Fort Edmonton Bar. Thank you. I'm going to stand up here. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say a couple of thank yous. Um, first, just wanted to thank Audrey for the honor of being here today. Um, being in, in this is this is a ceremony, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I also, Chantelle, your message is beautiful, and um, uh, it's a blessing to be here with you. Uh, I'd also like to just thank everyone that came today. Um, it's like if a tree falls and no one's there, does somebody hear it? So I think we're all trees falling down, and we're we're hearing each other. Um, <laughs> so, uh, 
Chantel, you mentioned, sorry, we're puffing away here. Um, Chantel, you mentioned. Um, okay. Yeah, can you still hear me? Okay. I, w I, I worry because I'm very soft spoken, um, but I am a teacher and I can find a voice. So, um, Chantel, you mentioned um, the trauma and the intergenerational trauma of residential schools. And so I, um, I wrote a poem just shortly, just, just days after the discovery of the children's remains at um, uh, the Kamloops uh, uh, in, in BC. But Chantel, you also mentioned that you were born at an old residential school in Edmonton. I think you were speaking of the camp, or sorry, an old, the old you're not the school, but the hospital. Uh, my mother um, defied every negative stereotype about in Indigenous women. She was a neonatal intensive care unit nurse for 37 years. And she, some of her training was at the Kamsel Hospital. And um, my dad was white, but he spoke Cree fluently because he was raised amongst the Cree. Um, my mom, I mean, my mother is indigenous um, and I look just like her and, and Audrey can tell you this, but my mom is a beautiful brown and um, the language and culture was all taken away. Uh, and when I pursued this path of who are we, I walk down the street and people see a white woman, but I'm not really. And this is not to say that, like I'm not, <laughs> I have so many good white people in my life. I'm not saying that white people are bad people. That's not what I'm saying. But um, uh, when I started to learn Cree, I learned this beautiful word, Yutsumos. And I said it to my mother and she went back 40 years and she remembered training uh, at the Kamsel Hospital, and there was a little girl there who kept calling my mom, Mitzmos. Sorry, I hadn't meant it. <laughs> I hadn't intended on telling that story, but I knew that you were born there, just brought it back. Take a breath. Okay, so this poem is called, um, th this poem has some Cree in it, um, which is um, not, not a lot, but the English that you hear, usually immediately before the Cree, the English that you hear is the translation of the Cree. So I have to do this because I can't see the words unless I, <laughs> I do that. <coughs> I also um, just want to add one thing. Um, Chantal, you referred to the 94 calls to action and um, making a difference. And so I write poetry as my call to action. And I, th I think it's in one of those 94. So. Peiki wait the heck, bring them home. What can a poem do but speak the truth? Ka tap wait. Shout the truth, ka te wait. Step one of indigenous grief, my friend Shannon tells me. Pei ki wait the heck. What can a poem do but whisper? E kiti makithawa kek, our deep unwhisperable sorrow for 215 children. Spell it out, 215 small bodies. Count it out, 44,000. 290 small bones. Pei ki the heck. What can a poem do but utter a prayer? E I am histamawa kick for 215 children, for thousands of other children who never saw their families again, ever. Pei ki the heck. What can a poem do when it can't reach stage four of grief? Laughter, not yet, perhaps not ever, not until the children come home, not until the Pope says sorry for the crimes of the church, not until governments stop apologizing while doing so little, not until we all walk with our indigenous sisters and brothers on the mean streets of Canada. Pei ki the heck. Not until the children 
come in from the dark. Namoya Patma e pita kwetua we a wasasaki te utseka wana te fiskaik. Peiki wetehek, peiki wetehek, peiki wetehek. We need a copy of that, Naomi, please. So I get it right away. Oh, thank you, my dear. It's hard to follow that. Our meditation is on page 518 in the hymn book. Grandfather. from the Ojibwe relatives in North America. Would you please respond with the italicized words? But take a breath first, a sacred breath. Grandfather, look at our brokenness. We know that we are the ones who are divided. Grandfather, sacred one, teach us love, compassion, and honor. We'll have a time of silence for reflection and inner peace. Music for song number 318, We Would Be One. This was the favorite song of my dearest friend, Corey Rensing, and it was one of the songs that brought me into the church, actually. Number 318. To Sandy Shirley Rowe.
we share our abundance all the time with groups who are uh, NGOs who work for helping other people and other charities. And this month it is the, uh, the turkey drive to help people have a better Christmas. So uh, we invite you to see those uh, collection plates at both sides of the sanctuary and to put every single extra penny that you have in your pockets and, and uh, to make sure that uh, we follow through on some of our principles too. Closing words are from one of our long-term activists and inspirations to the social justice group, Sylvia Crow. Strong advocate for human rights. And I will take, allow you to take the mic. Never ask, what is the sense of our small effort? We must move forward one step at a time because there is too much work to do and we have the reasons right in front of us every day. And as Margaret Mead stated, never doubt that a small committed group of citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Truer words were never smoke spoken. I, I shouldn't say smoken. <laughs> And Chantel, please extinguish the chalice for us. And thank you so much for being with us today. Our time together today is finished, but we know our work is not done. May our spirits and our resolve be renewed as we meet the challenges of the weeks ahead. The chalice flame is extinguished until we light it again and again with our convictions. Blessed be. Announcements. Sincere thanks to all our techies up there who made this work and to the rest of the technical crew that were here yesterday and putting us through our paces. To Gordon, love forever from all of us for the beautiful playing. To Chantel, we will be seeing you again, I'm sure. To Naomi for speaking truth and for breaking my heart. Sylvia and the Social Justice uh, Committee for the hard work that they do. And for all of you who came today. And Rosemary, I know that you've been so busy so I haven't nailed you for the last two weeks but I would so love to have you come up and say a word, few words about social justice and anything that's in your heart before we close. No pressure. <laughs> I'd be honored, thank you. You have spoke to my heart, thank you. I was raised amongst the Stolo people in the Chilliwack area. And um, this is work is near and dear to my heart. My best friends were uh, girls and women that lived on reserve. I am so glad that um, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton has given our delegates a clear mandate to vote yes to adopt the eighth principle. It is very clear that this is what we want. And uh, as we have heard today, there is work to do. Adopting the eighth principle is a, we line up at the starting gate now. The gates are still closed and they will open and we will do some work. The, adopting the eighth principle, people say it's a call to action and I say yes, it's a call to action. Thank you, it's a call to action so we will become active and we will learn what we need to do to bring the eighth principle to life amongst ourselves. Well, <laughs> there goes my memory. Okay, um, basically the eighth principle says that we affirm to covenant and promote dismantling racism and systems that oppress 
within ourselves, so learning how we are implicit biases and our privilege keeps us from doing the right thing or from understanding what the right thing is. It's more about our understanding and also uh, dismantling the systems that oppress. So we are now given a mandate, a clear mandate, that this is the work that we need to do. I'm really excited about it, you might be able to tell. I have two other announcements. I know it's late, but hang in there with me. There have been folks working in the warehouse section, turning it into office space so that it can be rented to the, our open door people. So they've been using the Keeler Hall, and now they're going to move into the warehouse fairly soon. The, the rental agreement is signed. And there's been four men predominantly that have been working on that. Gaylord, Medill, David Hagel, Alan Boyle and Michael Keast. And we, hmm? And art. And art. And others. And I'm sorry if I've missed anyone. There has been so much work going on. And it has left these four women that have been left behind without the, any spouse at home. <laughs> and I wish to thank them as well. Thank you, Sylvia, Paulette, and Winona, for allowing these wonderful people to come and work in our sanctuary. And I have a card for each of you. Uh, we also, I just would like to offer a round of applause for these folks. Lastly, next weekend is an exciting weekend. The Canadian Unitarian Council is celebrating its 60th anniversary. There is activities going on all week. Please watch for uh, in our newsletter and um, weekly e-blast, but you can go online, cuc.ca. I invite you to join in in the festivities. I think it's going to be great. There's some wonderful stuff happening starting Friday night. Online, of course, everything's online. And our service next Sunday will be joining the Canadian Unitarian Council for the, for the national service. And it will start at a different time. And I think it's 11? Maybe? Is it 11? 11 Mountain Time, yeah. So we won't be meeting in the sanctuary at all next Sunday. Okay? At 11 o'clock, right? At 11 o'clock in your, in your jammies at home. Before we close off today, I want to... Would okay, there is a card out in the foyer for the uh, family of Lilius Cal uh, Lily uh, Lilas Lee. Lisney, pardon me, Lilas Lisney. So would please sign the card so it can be sent to her family. And... Uh, if there are no more announcements, I just want to ask one thing that before the uh, uh, social justice group leaves that I'd like to have a picture with Rosemary and the social justice group so that I could really prove that we did this, okay? <laughs> um, um, I was really worried about uh, Chantel traveling when we had that terrible blizzard. I had visions of her sliding off the road in, over by Airdrie and landing in the the snow drift that happened to uh, some of us one Christmas. So she, the weather changed enough and we were brave. And I, I was, I was, I don't know, I guess the, the mother in you, you just, you know, you're just holding on and saying, to her, you know, are the roads going to be okay? Or, you know, the black ice and all of this stuff. So when she walked through my door, I, I had one of those breaths. <laughs> okay. No other announcements, so we'll have our closing song. And then, oh, if you would play that same song for the folks that I would think that you're the best thing since sliced bread. Okay, it's beautiful. <laughs> Carry the flame. <laughs> when you played a little while ago, was this? Yeah, yeah.